Um, welcome to TLGS 2022. My name is Elaine Walker from Mississippi University for Women. I'll be collecting questions in the chat for this session, which is striking a balance, evidence synthesis support for graduate students. So with that, I'll let Elizabeth and Kelly take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Klein from the University of Arizona. I will be your second speaker today. So first off, our initial presenter, please. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Hangauer, and I'm the Education Psychology Librarian at the University of Iowa. And yeah, striking a balance, evidence synthesis, support for graduate students, and let's dive into it. So first of all, what is evidence synthesis? The aim of evidence synthesis is to identify and synthesize all of the scholarly research on a particular topic, including both published and unpublished studies. It involves a methodical and comprehensive comprehensive literature search guided by careful study design. And evidence syntheses are based on well-formulated research questions and strive to be as unbiased, transparent, and reproducible as possible. While the term evidence synthesis might be new for some of you, uh, you are likely familiar with the individual approaches to evidence synthesis, such as systematic reviews, meta-analyses, scoping reviews, rapid reviews, umbrella reviews, and there's uh, much more. So the Evidence Synthesis Institute is a four-day online workshop funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and is a partnership between the University of Minnesota, Cornell University, and Carnegie Mellon University. The goal of the Institute is to equip librarians who work outside of the health sciences with the tools to provide evidence synthesis support at their institutions. The ESI began in spring 2021 with six institutes planned. In August 2020, Elizabeth, my co-presenter, attended a precursor to the Evidence Synthesis Institute, which was a three-day IMLS-funded virtual training called Systematic Reviews and Evidence Synthesis Beyond the Health Sciences, a training for librarians. And in August 2021, I attended the Evidence Synthesis Institute. The Institute is limited in how many people can, get, uh, can sign up, and there's an application process you need to go through to get accepted. But if you're interested in providing evidence synthesis support, I would highly recommend the Evidence Synthesis Institute. It is very well planned out. There are lots of learning objects and resources, and there's ample opportunity to um, learn, ask questions, and build community. And a lot of the resources are freely available and it's linked here through the press books. After Elizabeth and I had this in-depth training with experts in the field, the question we both came away with was, where do we go from here? <clears throat> in other words, how do we apply what we learned within our institutions? Today, we'll be presenting two different approaches to this question, one being a more bottom-up ad hoc approach and the other more top-down and programmatic. We will highlight some of the practical considerations of these approaches and give you insight into some of the issues we have grappled with. <clears throat> so I'm representing the bottom-up ad hoc approach, which means that no one told me that I have to provide this service. This is something I did on my own accord because I saw a need for it in my liaison areas. I'm a librarian at the University of Iowa, which is a large public R1 institution in the Midwest. And I work with the College of Education, Psychological and Brain Sciences Department and Linguistics Department. And I've been at the University of Iowa for just over two and a half years. So I'm relatively new to evidence synthesis, but when I first started at Iowa, um, I realized there was, an all, there was already a robust systematic review service offered by the Health Sciences Library. And due to my interest in uh, evidence synthesis, I met with and received training from the Health Sciences Librarian on specifically systematic reviews. Also during this time, I became comfortable with the citation management software EndNote, uh, which was a, a change of being someone who really likes Zotero. But um, so after learning about more about the process from my health sciences colleagues, shadowing a few systematic review consultations, and attending the Evidence Synthesis Institute, I began to feel more com confident in my ability to provide support in my liaison areas. And there were already requests being routed through the Health Sciences Library, and so it was easy for me to get involved. Outside of this, though, I have done absolutely no marketing of my own. Students generally come to me through word of mouth, from faculty or their peers, and sometimes graduate students have a class where they are supposed to develop a systematic review, and other times these students are conducting a systematic review or meta-analysis for their comprehensive exams. 
The librarian can have different degrees of involvement with evidence synthesis projects. They can consult and offer advice, or they can be more involved in a co-authorship role. As this graphic shows, librarians have the opportunity to assist with the planning, conducting, and reporting phase of the evidence synthesis project. I recently got this breakdown of levels of service from the health sciences librarians at the University of Iowa, and I think it's really useful. Level one, which is the lowest level, um, librarians offer training on conducting effective database searching, identifying sources and or using EndNote for citation management. Level two, librarians will review the search strategy that's already been completed for accuracy. And a level three service, the librarian will actually collaborate with the researcher or research team to build a, an effective search strategy. Level four, which signifies the highest level involvement, the librarian will provide extensive assistance with development of protocol, design of search strategies, assistance with removing duplicates, managing citations, documenting process, including a con the contribution to the methods section write-up. So it makes sense that this level four involvement would mean that co-authorship might be appropriate. For, levels, for level three, librarians can expect to get an acknowledgement in the published manuscript, and for levels one and two, when librarians are providing training and feedback, but not actually doing any of the work, then neither authorship nor acknowledgement would be expected. Now, these are general guidelines that vary across institutions, but you usually see some form of this arrangement. And for our purposes, we need to consider how graduate students in particular fit into this schema of service. And we'll talk more about this as we go along. The planning and conducting phases that were shown in the previous slide involve the creation, testing, and implementation of a search strategy. And this is not just any search strategy, but is a deeply thought out and intentional search that seeks to find a balance between sensitivity or comprehensiveness and specificity or precision of search results. It makes sense that librarians would be great partners during this process. Research has shown that librarians improve the quality of the search strategy, and this is because librarians have an in-depth understanding of Boolean operators, proximity searching, truncation, and subject terms, as well as a thorough knowledge of library databases and the differences between them. In the next few slides, I'm going to give you a breakdown of how I approach working with graduate students on evidence synthesis projects. I feel like the initial meeting is one of the most important meetings in this process because it establishes the nature of the consultative relationship and establishes expectations. So as I mentioned, um, this is an ad hoc approach to providing evidence synthesis support. And so I actually don't have an intake form. Because of this, I'm not always aware that the meeting is gonna be about evidence synthesis and students don't need to complete uh, work prior to the meeting. This works for now, but is not necessarily sustainable. Uh, once I realize that it's an evidence synthesis project, I will talk to the student and direct them to the health sciences library guide on systematic reviews. Even though it's a guide for the health sciences and I'm outside of the health sciences, it is still a super useful tool for guiding the conversation, establishing those expectations. The guide includes information on first steps, such as protocols, protocol registration, PRISMA guidelines, as well as an example timeline. At this point, I do generally warn students that the creation of a high quality search strategy is likely more involved than they anticipate. After these preliminaries, I will then get to know their research topic. Similar to a rev regular reference interview, I have them talk about their research while I take notes and ask clarifying questions. These topics can be highly complex and specific, and so it's important to me that the researcher can explain it in terms that I can understand. Once the topic is explained and major concepts are identified, we then move on to a discussion and demonstration of preliminary searching. And then we end the, uh, the meeting with action items. And this generally includes uh, having the students complete a protocol worksheet and also identify five to 10 research articles that would meet their criteria. These articles are actually really important moving forward because it allows the researcher to think closely about their exclusion and inclusion criteria, allows us to harvest the keywords and subject terms in the articles, and will be used to test the quality of the search queries in each database. So I mentioned preliminary searching. Preliminary searching involves all the trial and error that goes into creating a sound search strategy. Because with evidence synthesis, the goal is to have developed a search query that can be translated across databases and that when it's ready, can be run all at the same time. 
Evidence synthesis search queries tend to be highly complex, and so it is advisable for the graduate student to keep track of their searches in a research log. With these types of projects, it is really important to document the thought process so that decisions can be justified later on, perhaps to a reviewer. Based on the graduate student's topic, I will suggest some databases that might be useful. Databases will include both discipline specific, such as Psych Info, CINAHL, Education Source, and ERIC uh, for my disciplines, and larger citation databases that are broader in scope and interdisciplinary, including PubMed, Web of Science, Scopus, and maybe Embase. Based on the research question, we will usually do some combination of these. Now, Google Scholar is something that comes up a lot. And what I have learned is that Google Scholar is useful in preliminary searching, but it will not be a database used in the final search strategy. This is because Google Scholar, being the black box that it is, does not lend itself to reproducible and transparent searching. What Google Scholar is useful for at an early phase in the process is tracking down a similarly themed systematic review. Having an example systematic review on hand is great, but I do warn students that not all systematic reviews are equal and that sometimes the search strategy presented in the methods section really isn't that good. I'll then ask if they're planning to use gray literature. Many researchers aren't familiar with this term, and so it's good to explain what it is and why it's important to include. Eliminating public publication bias is one good reason. If students are going to include it, we discuss using something like ProQuest dissertations and DCs Global, as well as Google for searching for reports, white papers, and conference proceedings from organizations and associations. Lastly, I will demonstrate a basic search on their topic using a primary database, which might be psych info for psychology students. At this point, I will talk to them about subject terms. And some of you might be aware that researchers working on evidence synthesis don't always want to use subject terms. And what I tell graduate students is that using subject terms in their final search query is a best practice and is highly recommended. But at the same time, they should keep in mind that it is a fairly time-consuming process to identify all relevant subject terms for each database because it differs, and then to find a balance between the use of keywords and subject terms in their final search query. Because Subject, because subject terms can be met with resistance, I tell students that if they decide not to use subject terms, they should at the very least look at all the relevant subject terms in each database and have a reason for not including them. One legitimate reason could be that their keywords are capturing the relevant subject terms. Either way, I continue to encourage them to document their thought process in the research log. With this type of service, time commitment is a major consideration. So these numbers are based on three graduate student evidence synthesis projects I've consulted on, all of which were for their comprehensive exams. On average, I met with students for an hour long meeting five times throughout the semester. I sent around 10 substantive emails regarding search queries, screening software and accessing articles. I spent one to two hours running the final searches and deduplicating results in EndNote. So I do offer to run the final search and deduplicate for them, but I know others might disagree with this approach. The reason I do this is A, it's actually more time efficient for me to do it on my own than to walk the student through how to do this. And B, there are nuances in the databases when it comes to extracting the, the RIS files that are mundane and ultimately not that important. So rather than explain these nuances, I would rather just handle it myself. This could change in the future, depending on, on the progression of the service. Generally speaking, students are extremely grateful for the service, but I have had students um, who do want to walk through the process, so the final, um, final search and deduplicating process, uh, so they can know how to do it in the future. Another approach to this that I've seen is to record an, record an example search in a couple of databases and then show how to extract the RIS file and deduplicate in EndNote. This way the librarian is not doing all the work and the student has the video recording as a reference point. So if we return to the levels of service chart, I would say I'm providing the following services uh, for graduate students that are highlighted in yellow. Training on database and citation management software, collaborating to build effective search strategies, and removing duplicates. I'm only minimally involved with the creation of the protocol. I don't document the process. This is something they do in the research log. I don't screen records, and I'm not involved with writing uh, the methods section. And based on this service, I do uh, based on the service I do provide, I 
I ask for an acknowledgement in any potentially published manuscript. Some final considerations before I turn it over to Elizabeth. Um, you might be asked to update the search for publication. And so after the, the graduate student gets through their comprehensive exam, they are likely going to be interested in submitting their systematic, if it's a systematic review or other type of evidence synthesis project for publication. And they'll return to generally the librarian to, to update the search. So to capture all the articles that have been published since the initial search was run. Uh, and this can actually be more complicated than, than, than you might anticipate. And so I, I'll uh, extend the invitation. You can reach out to me if you want to know my process for doing this in EndNote. Um, and lastly, this is what works for me right now. I enjoy assisting graduate students with their evidence synthesis work. I have not found it to be a burden or too overwhelming, but by no means is this what will work for everyone. But I hope seeing my process can, um, can be uh, of interest or of use to you. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Elizabeth, who's going to share her screen. Um, do you see me sharing now? Uh, yes. Okay. Are, am I on the slideshow? No. Oh, you are on the slideshow. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So now I'm going to my slide. Okay, so greetings, friends. Um, I'll be sharing the top-down uh, approach to establishing an evidence synthesis service using my experience of an unpublished pilot model, um, model at the University of Arizona. But first, I'll begin by providing some local context for you for this conversation. The University of Arizona is a flagship institution in the state of Arizona. It is a large public R1 HSI land-grant institution located in the southern part of the state in Tucson, Arizona. HSI is Hispanic serving, serving institution. It is a federal recognition for colleges and universities with 25% or more total undergraduate uh, full Hispanic full-time enrollment. Our health science librarians have been providing the evidence synthesis service since about 2008, and it's similar to the level four uh, uh, model that uh, Kelly shared with us earlier today. Um, and so they earn publication credit for a lot, all, all of the effort that they, that they provide. Our graduate student enrollment in 2021 was just under 11,000. And there are over 130 colleges, individual colleges, departments, and programs currently offering uh, graduate programs in more than 150 areas of studies. Now, before I move on from this slide, I really want to highlight a couple of fun facts about the University of Arizona. The image here shows Old Main, which is the original building built in 1887. First classes began in 1891, where six faculty members taught a total of 32 students. Students would ride horses to class and tied them outside of hitching posts outside of Old Main. Now, looking at the landscape here, see our beautiful desert, uh, local flora. It's the, the infinite saguaras, which can grow over 40 feet tall and often live 150 to 200, in year, to 200 years. So if you'd like to travel, this might be a nice fun destination to keep in mind. I'm always wanting a reason to travel, so think that perhaps I'll uh, tour universities as, a, as an activity. Okay, so back to the presentation. Hey, Elizabeth, um, I mentioned that, Yes. Uh, um, if you just want to hit the slideshow, because it's showing the, the smaller version. If you oh, hit okay. slideshow and it'll make it. Sorry. Yeah. Am I there? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. My apologies. So I mentioned in the previous slide that health science librarians have been offering the evidence synthesis support since 2008. Um, in about... Thereabouts 2018, I began receiving requests for some of my disciplines that I cover. At that time, no service model existed, so I would simply turn researchers away. I would alert my supervisor about increasing requests that I could not, uh, increasing requests coming in that I could not support. Fiscal year 2020, 2021, the University of Arizona Libraries uh, uh, embarked in future state planning process, which is an, a reorganization. My supervisor at that time brought up the research gap during the future state discussions. 
So in fiscal year 2021, the restructuring exercise resulted in a new, in a new unit at the, universe, at the main library that undertook a new service portfolio consisting of several focused research areas, including evidence synthesis. One additional change to, uh, from this reorganization was that librarians were distributed amongst two different departments in the, uh, in the library. In 2022, February, just last month, I held a discussion with liaison librarians about the pilot model, uh, service model that I've been conducting. So what is this published, uh, published model? So I mentioned our reorganization consisted of some departments with new units. In July, 2021, I was reassigned to one of the new departments with the, unit, with the new unit specifically charged with consolidating activities associated with research planning with a new service portfolio, which is evidence synthesis. So, since I was the one that brought, often brought up the service gap, it was quite fitting that I was given this new area of responsibility. I was giving a job description at the time, labeling me as an evidence synthesis librarian, but I declined such a title for several reasons. First and foremost, I still had other areas of responsibility, in, uh, including serving as liaison to six separate departments. So I suggested a more inclusive and representative title of my work, which is research engagement librarian. One of the main reasons being is that I also plan up to go for going up for promotion and I was sensitive to how my job and outputs would be considered during that process. Okay, so once our unit was formalized and ready to start, I took on responsibility for supporting evidence synthesis research requests at UA main campus and began running this uh, unpublished model. Per the restructuring, that was institutional driven support for this work, but the reality was and is that I and I alone am a single librarian carrying the sole duty to help researchers navigate the systematic review process from protocol to publication. And here on the screen is a quick uh, view of the evidence synthesis process, which is preparation, searching, retrieval, screening, synthesizing, and write-up. I also have the responsibility to provide oversight, coordination, and ongoing development for the service. So the last two points here are really important to consider when I share my experiences. I was given the full freedom to design the service. My new supervisor's strengths are in digital scholarship. She was not at all familiar with any, uh, uh, anything related to evidence synthesis research, nor typical liaison work. She, uh, but however, that's not to suggest that as a negative thing. In fact, quite the opposite. She trusted me and had faith that I could conduct this work. Also, I knew the collaborative model, how sciences operated, and I knew there was no way that I would be able to offer the same kind of support. I wanted to gain firsthand insight about the totality of the work and how libraries could support. So thinking about how I could maximize support to the greatest number of researchers, knowing that there was no resources except me, I was the one that devised this model. And quite simply, the best way to learn about the service was just to dive in. You will see that this model is rooted in my philosophy of librarianship to educate and help enable self-sufficient users and to bring value to librarian work. And it was is also in perfect alignment with my research interest in helping graduate students move through their training more easily. So speaking of training, what training did I receive? In 2018, 2020, I would just observe and digest and analyze as my health science colleague would assist me with some of the requests that would come in. In March of 2020, I received a meta-analysis request. This was at the onset of COVID. Um, so recall that there was no existing model at the time. So I took on the request as a training opportunity with a uh, health sciences colleague serving as my mentor. During my hands-on training, one of the resources that was particularly helpful in helping me understand the process better is listed there on the screen. I often consulted that book and, uh, so that I could uh, understand more of the, the details of, the, of the, the work. Then in August of 2020, I attended the uh, institute that Kelly mentioned earlier. Now, I'm a very reflective uh, learner, so a three-day continuous training was very intense for me. I did pretty well taking note, decent notes at the beginning of, this, of, of the uh, 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 training, 
Day one, my notes were pretty well, well kept. Day two, my capacity began to wane. And by day three, they were just very slim. Um, but thankfully, the organizers recorded the training. And since then, I have been able to review all of the sessions and complete my notes. I agree with Kelly that the IMLS training is, is great. And also in conjunction that I with the training that I received with my colleague, it was superb in helping me understand the basis of evidence synthesis research. Now these next slides will display data about the pilot, keeping in mind that it's only been happening for about seven months. So the data is not huge, but it is still informative to us. So in total, since July, I have received a total uh, a number of 12 requests, six from PhD can, uh, candidates, four faculty, and two undergraduate students. The focus of the findings will be on the graduate students because this is a graduate student conference. But I also have observations and some interesting trends that I've observed from the other two user groups. The departments. Uh, the, I've received requests from seven different non-health sciences disciplinary areas. It's important to highlight that at least for four of these uh, areas, they are outside of my disciplinary areas. And I'll talk about uh, that in just uh, a little bit. So just focus on that, uh, notice that, remember that. Now, earlier I mentioned the various phases of an evidence synthesis project, preparation, searching, retrieval, screening, synthesizing, and write-up phases. This figure plots the current phase of each request that I've received. These types of projects vary in length from uh, anywhere from six months to up to a year to complete. The information, information gathering grouping I have here includes those projects that after discussing the resourcing and time frame necessary to complete the project, the, re the researchers then realized that a systematic review was not gonna be an appropriate uh, methodology. So I believe I counted about five of those that are not gonna go forward. And for the projects that I currently have, only one cr has currently gone to the search phase. Systematic reviews and scoping reviews are the most commonly requested types of reviews. There have also been two meta-analyses requests, both from undergraduates, surprisingly, doing semester-long projects. In both of these situations, however, uh, not only are these students really not ready for this type of research, they just don't have the time and the resources to complete the work, nor do they fully understand the process. So how do we find out about the service if it is unpublished? So there's no marketing going on or anything. Well, it's through the great relationships already established with liaisons. When a liaison receives a request from their users, they simply uh, forward that request onto me because I, they know that this is a new area that um, I'm, I'm, I'm conducting. It's also similar to what Kelly mentioned. It's a word of mouth. It just really gets around. One request is, uh, also came through us through the Ask Us service. And quite frankly, it's the same old, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. These uh, people are just so smart and they will just find out. So how do I spend the majority of my time? It soon became apparent that tracking time would not be feasible for me since I was doing so much uh, through the process. Um, so the following slides are intended to give you a sense of the activities where I spend the majority of my time and effort. My initial consultation, just like Kelly, includes a, a, a conversation discussing the process, the required resources, and the available library support via the consultative model. After the initial conversation, subsequent conver conversations center around specific questions researchers have that are pertaining to their projects, including questions about the process and resources. And also, we spend time learning about their topic, the study design, and protocol development. Kelly went into great detail about his uh, activities during the search process, and one main difference between what he does and what I do is that I do not run any searches for, uh, for researchers. Instead, I teach them and guide researchers through the search process. So I talk about indexing, uh, search strategies, uh, control vocabulary, etc. cetera. Um, so we spend time doing that. After each meeting, I also spend time finding, compiling, and sharing useful resources with researchers. Again, 
specific to their project. This includes protocol templates or published protocols to guide them during the, their work, as well as documentation templates to help researchers keep track of their work, videos, articles, etc. My meeting time on my calendar is really in my research availability. So uh, when they can meet is when I can meet, except of course, when I have a conflict. But the area where I can exert some time management control is with learning activities. I'm currently blocking two days in my work week to dedicate to learning activities. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a very, very reflective person. So I need time to read, digest, analyze, and process information. Of course, I still have my liaison duties and professional service activities to conduct. Uh, but during these two days, uh, I try to review notes and resources. Um, I, I learn about registries and frameworks, prin guiding principles in different disciplines. I analyze published protocols. I read articles about evidence synthesis, research, and services. I am learning about different types of reviews. Um, there's also a great resource, the Expert Searching Listserv. It is vast with great resources and, and wonderful conversations, but it's also quite active and can be very overwhelming and taxing to my mental capacity. Additional time is spent planning and anticipating work downstream, downstream in the process. As you know, I've only had one project proceed to the search phase, and there are still more phases in, in the process remaining. So I already know that I will be spending, uh, needing to spend time helping researchers with activities such as collection and duplication, accessing full text, and providing feedback on their search methodology because they will eventually have questions. And finally, I spend time thinking about the trends I'm noticing that will shape the ongoing development of the service. Some observations that I have made are that a high number of requests are originating from graduate students. After one meeting with a graduate student, I learned about some re recent refinements to their graduation requirements. In particular, this program made a recent change that will allow students to do a systematic review as an element of the comps process, replacing one of the sit down exams. So liaisons need to be in tune with these trending changes in graduation requirements in their program that will have an impact in support to graduate student success. It also appears that amount and accuracy of knowledge graduate students have about evidence synthesis research is split evenly. Some know enough about evidence synthesis work, having participated in this type of research before or read systematic review articles or heard about it through the programs or mentors. And in those situations, I help just expand their understanding about it, about the process. Others do not have any idea what it involves or what it will take to conduct this type of research. Those become a lot more intensive to handle. Graduate students mentors don't really realize the extent of work skills and resources required uh, to complete this work. Commonly, this type of research requires a team. Two minimum members uh, uh, are required. So this is a, if this is a graduate student project, there might be a problem. And really not a problem, it's just something to work through. Um, a useful to, it is also useful to have mentoring discussions during consultations with the graduate student. They are key in helping students determine not only the feasibility of the work, but also consider the timeline and resources, which are just as critical. Oops, I went too far. Other key observations I've made are that I lack the disciplinary, um, the subject disciplinary expertise to assist researchers during the search phase in areas outside of my disciplines. Similarly, I am not equipped, equipped with the expertise to help researchers identify appropriate information resources to search in areas outside of my disciplines. And honestly, and quite frankly, this is out of scope with my duties and is simply not a reasonable expectation that I learn a whole new set of specialized resources. There is also certainly something in knowing about the culture of a discipline. I know that liaisons adult, adopt disciplinary discourse practices and know best how to communicate with their users. They know the tidbits of information to share with them, how to frame the information, et cetera. In one occasion, the type of information that I shared with researchers in one of my disciplines appeared just 
to teach events overwhelming for a researcher in a discipline outside of mine. Successes. As I reflected on what has worked well, it was very easy to come up with a list. I absolutely have the most generous and helpful colleagues. They willingly and joyfully share their expertise with me. They are always ready to help me when I have a question. Similarly, ACRL, ACRL is a wonderful network. Soon I'll be working with some members to develop a resource for librarians doing this type of work. So stay tuned. And of course, I have to say that also I am um, trying to convince Kelly to be my mentor to help me just as well. So you will find that people are just ready to lend a helping hand. Researchers are very comfortable and patient with my ongoing development. At our initial meeting, I am transparent with them and fully disclose that this is a new research area for me. I'm, uh, I, uh, I am not only learning, but also designing the service as we go along. Their kindness and compassion is extremely helpful and helps put me in, at ease. Learning is happening in a two-way uh, mode with the researchers and myself. Again, this model is rooted in the philosophy of, in my philosophy of librarianship, which is to educate and help enable self-sufficient users. And I really do see evidence of this when I work with, with uh, the researchers. As expected, my confidence and my comfort level is increasing and I can communicate effectively with researchers. I have strong man project management skills that are very uh, valuable when helping researchers navigate the process. I'm great at keeping an eye on tasks, on timelines, etc. cetera. Uh, I can work with a, a diverse group of individuals. I'm definitely not afraid to ask for help. I know my limitations. Um, and like I said, this is in perfect alignment with my research interests in helping graduate students move uh, through their training more easily. I also have to say that I have a great supervisor that is interested and engaged in my work. During our check-ins, she shares anything that she hears or learns about evidence synthesis, either at my organization or outside of uh, my organization. She is a great liaison with the health sciences colleagues, so she brings back information to our meetings. And that is extremely helpful so that I don't have to spend time doing uh, uh, at extra meetings and such, and I can focus on the work. On the other hand, there are also challenges. Infrastructure is needed in order for the service to be up and running officially. As I mentioned, I don't have a libguide and I often have to find and collect resources to share with uh, researchers, and this takes time. It would be great to have a, a, to streamline this process, have the resources at hand, even just like the, the intake form that Kelly mentioned would help ease a lot of the process. Especially also it would be helpful so requests don't get lost in my email. The more I learn, the less I know. I still have tons to learn. Um, the volume and intensity of the required learning plus the turnaround rate is overwhelming my mental capacity. I am normally a very active individual. I love waking up early. I love working out sometimes two times a day. However, while I wholeheartedly enjoy this work, I find that it is having a negative impact on my well-being. I have a pool full plate outside of work too, and I need to find balance soon. As requests increase, there might be a need for me to uh, renegotiate my work. However, the next big thing that needs to happen before all that is to determine where the service will go from here. I mentioned that I had a discussion with liaison, li liaison librarians in February, um, and that timing of the conversation was strategic in a number of ways. First, it was intended to allow us to have the same understanding of the of the state of evidence synthesis requests um, and the pilot model for me to share the pilot model uh, learnings. One of the goals was also to allow us to sh shape and improve the model collectively. It would give us a better sense of how to respond to researchers and send a unified message. It would also allow us to prepare with adequate resources and budget requests, especially in anticipation of upcoming uh, fiscal year budgeting requests. Uh, the budgeting process at our library. And finally, it would also help us to plan and discuss workload with supervisors for the next fiscal year. Now, during that meeting, I presented the following options listed here on the screen to our liaisons. The first option was not to offer the service until more resources are available. 
Second option was to taper down the consultative service where my only focus is to provide an overview of the process. Any subsequent requests from researchers would be fielded by liaisons who can accept requests at their own discretion and more importantly, be the ones that communicate to researchers any available support thereafter that they could provide. A different option was to continue as is, but to bring in liaisons to support during the search phase in, al in alignment with their liaison duties, which if you recall, is something like what Kelly is doing. His work, I believe, is the perfect representation of the vision for my model to bring in liaisons during the search process. Of course, there would need to be some, uh, um, some work to streamline the processes, but essentially it would offer a more, a more programmatic and structured approach to the service. And once again, this model is, ro is rooted in my philosophy of librarianship to educate and help enable self-sufficient users and bring value to librarian work. There was also a chance to bring up additional options on the spot for which no one provided any alternative. Uh, alternative. The meeting was well attended, yet nothing definitive came out of it. And I would be lying if I didn't say that I was a bit disappointed because trying to tease out a su suitable option, not only for the libraries, but also for researchers will be more work for me. And I don't feel like I have the time nor energy um, to do that work right now. However, I did fully understand their hesitation in just the same way that I was giving new responsibilities during the recent reorganization, many of my colleagues had a similar change. They too are trying to navigate the roles and also understand the new structure in the organization. So it is, uh, there, there, there is normal uncertainty on their part, not to mention probable hardships also than some people might still have experiencing from the post COVID period. So besides garnering buy-in from colleagues to support the service, I also have to balance a tug of war of sorts of top-down expectations from my supervisor. Although yes, I was giving full freedom to design the service, my supervisor has also conveyed an interest in, in me developing evidence synthesis offering, workshop offerings. She would also like for me to offer drop-in hours, which is something, some, uh, something that is very popular with other specialized areas in our library. And she would like for us to have the service support, the service or support merged with Health Sciences Library. I'll be thinking more about these options, and I am thinking also of other contingency options at this point, and I really don't know where this will go. So I am just as excited as, as, excited as you are to find out where this, uh, this will head. So we hope that today's discussion gives you a chance to see your own cells and your organization in the context of evidence synthesis service. Kelly and I will continue to explore our work at our institutions and continue to grapple with the following questions. What is the appropriate level of service for graduate students? How to prioritize evidence synthesis support for graduate students versus faculty? When organizing a service, how do you get liaisons on board? What kind of training can librarians pr provide faculty on evidence synthesis? And how can coordinators manage concerns around scope creep? And with that, um, I think we did good on time. We will be happy to take any questions. Yeah, absolutely. You guys have quite a few questions. So oh. I think the first few are for Kelly. Um, so the first one we have from Roman is, have you ever worked with a graduate student who approaches you um, indicating a desire to automate their research uh, by data mining? I have not. No. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have anything else to say. Yeah, I have not had that request. <clears throat> okay. Um, I have... Um, oh, okay, this is more of a comment uh, from Hillary. Um, she said, Kelly, I like how you explain the explanation of subject headings to students. I never thought to turn it around and ask them to document their reason for not using them. That was a different perspective. Uh, another question uh, from Allie. 
Um, I'm wondering if you have ever had pushback from departments or admin around the extent of your involvement in supporting students with their comps. Uh, sometimes we hear that students are expected to complete their comps on their own, and it's hard to know what extent uh, we can provide them with support. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Uh, in my experience, the faculty have been appreciative of it, of the support I give the graduate student. Um, and, you know, I, yeah, it's tough because, you know, some of the stuff, I think it's really important for the graduate student to learn it. Um, I also see that the, the amount of work that they have to go through to screen all this stuff and then to synthesize it. And, and a lot of them are doing meta-analyses, which is like, I don't have anything to do with that. And that's like, in and of itself, I think a ton of work. So I think that the fact that I can be helpful in developing a, a really good search strategy is um, something I'm, I'm happy to do. And, I, and faculty seem to appreciate it so far. Excellent, thank you. Um, Elizabeth, I believe our next question is for you from Jenny. Um, have you thought to bring in liaisons for other disciplines to support your graduate students? So in the, there has been a request that came in that I uh, did involve another liaison and she also has uh, been involved in evidence synthesis work. So that was not a hard uh, 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 collaboration and it was not hard to convince her. Um, but in the other ones that have come in, by and large, a lot of them have been in my disciplinary areas. Um, but yes, when other requests come in, I do bring in other liaison librarians. I brought in an education librarian um, but it, at this point, being able to um, say that we have all liaisons and, and we'll be able to support all the disciplines that come in, it's, it's, it, we're not there yet. So some are yes, some are on board, so others are not. Okay, thank you. And you've gotten uh, several comments about um, how you've addressed um, knowing our limitations. I know as librarians, we wear a lot of different hats, but we don't have to wear all the hats. <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, lots of wonderful comments. Um, I believe that is it. Oh, I've got one from Kate. Um, would it be possible to shift from a one-on-one -on -one consult consulting model to a workshop slash certificate model? Can you repeat that again? Would it be possible to switch from a consultative model to a workshop model? Yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of uh, wonderful opportunities, you know, and I think each one of us has to recognize what are our resources, what are our limitations, you know, what are our strengths, you know, who can participate. And then, you know, um, as, as I've noticed, and I'm uh, Kelly and others that have conducted this work, you know, you really have a lot of users, you know, you have faculty, faculty that serve as mentors to graduate students, you know, graduate students that are doing this work. Um, and so you have different kinds of audiences, audiences, you have different kinds of needs. One of the contingency plans that I'm thinking about, it has to do with, you know, then bringing some kind of training, or I don't know if it's a workshop, I, I don't have the name right now of it. Uh, but it is to uh, in support of graduate students, particularly that is uh, I am biased in that way and I recognize it and I share it widely. Um, it is a, 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 a user group that I think is very important for us to um, focus on. But yes, I think that that is definitely a great option. I'll just add to Kate's question about the one on one consulting versus or a workshop model, I think. Um, yeah, definitely doable if you build a really nice workshop certificate model. Um, and I think then the librarian can can offer, when I show those levels of service, maybe that first level where you're offering, or maybe it was the second level, uh, where you're offering feedback on the search strategy. So that that would be the, the main crux of, of what the librarian is doing is that student needs to have a search strategy all filled out and then the librarian offers, you know, really nice feedback for them. And so it's not as time intensive, but still useful. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have uh, one more question. Um, Erica asked um, if you guys could talk about um, other disciplines that are seeking out uh, the research help um, besides health sciences. Um, and if so, um, how do their demands differ? Well, I have, uh, well, Kelly is, uh, 
serving uh, users in his own disciplines and he he will share his you know but i have uh the breadth of main library which is non-health sciences and so any any discipline can come in so there are the requests that have come in i i think I'm, i had a slide it was law uh education speech language hearing sciences uh, ag people um uh, uh, psychology uh there's a breadth of, of different researchers doing this type of work. So they've come in. Um, I noted a couple of differences that I've noticed this, you know, which is in discourse practices, you know, how do you actually communicate? And that's one limitation that I have and that I recognize that uh, not all researchers are the same or they don't share the same, uh, uh, the culture is different. And so being able to know how to communicate with them is important too. I noticed that as a difference. Uh, I think for the most part, I haven't gotten more granular than that. You know, the process is the process. So I think it will work out for all of them. Of course, some of them, as I experienced, have had different uh, like frameworks. You know, how do you develop your research question? You know, you have a different framework for different disciplines and so knowing that kind of stuff, uh, which is uh, some of the learning that I'm having to do too. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I'll let Kelly uh, speak uh, a little bit about that. His yeah, uh, yeah. I, uh, education. I, uh, most of my requests come from education and psychology. I haven't gotten as many from linguistics. And I think, uh, Erica, you mentioned you're a humanities librarian. I, I, I think the trend is with social sciences. Um, is if you're looking outside the health sciences, social sciences tend to be much more interested in this type of uh, research, you know, methodology. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't believe we have. Any more questions, but um, this meeting is open, of course, <laughs> for a couple of more hours. Um, if we don't have any further questions, then you guys can have nine minutes back of your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for joining us today.